Julian, thank you again for uh, this incisive and, and really insightful uh, lecture that, that you brought us. And you say the, the image that we often use and that is maybe used more often today than before even of uh, looking at migration through the lens of the slave trade and of slavery is, is actually upended or is, is upside down because what we should be looking at is not slave trade but is slaves trying to get away from slavery into freer uh, societies. So one question that I had when listening to the, to the lecture is uh, about the slave-like uh, conditions that migrants in our societies in Europe work in. And you give the example of uh, Dawood, who is from South Sudan, who ends up working illegally in the UK. And you say he does not want to be rescued, which I think is, is a very poignant uh, image that brings home your whole point. But then the question remains... How do we look at those working conditions? Because he is probably being badly paid. He does work long hours. If not as a slave-like condition, then how do you look at those working conditions and is there a better way of approaching them? Yeah, I mean, it's the problem is for, for those migrants in those sorts of situations is that they aren't covered by the mechanisms that are designed to protect EU national workers from abuse and exploitation. So EU nationals are protected from poor and violent treatment in the workplace. And also, at least in theory, um, they enjoy a certain level of social protection um, from the market. So welfare and housing and, and health benefits, which mean that if they find themselves working for an abusive employer, then they've got the freedom to um, quit without worrying that quitting will mean utter destitution and, and homelessness. You know, even though obviously we could talk about how, how those kinds of protections are being undermined even for EU nationals in, in various countries. But um, for irregular migrants without the right to work, there, there is no real choice if a, an employer is providing them with a caravan to sleep in, e even if it's a horrible, dilapidated caravan and paying them something, even way less than the minimum wage, you know, uh, if you're not going to leave, even if things are bad, if it's going to mean that you're sleeping on the streets, starving, potentially going to be picked up by the authorities because you're more visible to them and deported. So um, I, I guess that I feel that if we're going to look to history, then their experience is actually much more like that of many free wage workers in 19th century Europe who also faced the choice of, you know, either you keep working or you starve and had to keep on working, even if they were sick, even if their employer beat them or sexually abused them or, or cheated them. Uh, and, you know, it was not the anti-slavery movement that changed that. It was workers' collective political struggles. It was the labor movement um, that eventually managed to secure basic protections for workers and to ensure that they had a degree of freedom to change employer and certain rights within the workplace. And I guess the trouble is, was, is, remains that these protections were linked to citizenship. Um, and the, the model of worker citizenship leaves many groups excluded from the cover of these, these sorts of protections. And I guess, again, this is why I think it, the slavery and, and metaphor is, is not a particularly helpful one in terms of thinking about how we might try to uh, pursue rights and protections for those workers. It does refer to what you said in the lecture though, that uh, the, the situation that most especially refugees, asylum seekers or irregular migrants who manage to get to the UK or to Europe, uh, the situation that they find themselves in at that moment is comparable to 
slaves who managed to get to the free north in the United States in the 19th century or the early 20th century for that matter uh, because even though they are in a place where slavery doesn't exist, they are still considered slaves under that legal framework that denies them equal citizenship rights, e equal rights as a civilian, as a, as a person, as a human, which is pretty much what, what we see, especially when people are not granted asylum st or refugee status and they're in irregular uh, situation. So these, the, the bottom line seems to be, and um, uh, that's my question, is it all about rights rather than getting excited about uh, something like modern slavery? Should we worry more about the rights for every human being? Is that the point? Um, yeah. That's, that's exactly it, I think, about rights, but not just rights, because um, rights on their own aren't enough. You can have rights, but the, the key thing is equality, because under some slave uh, regimes, enslaved people did actually have certain rights. It wasn't that they were entirely without rights, it was that they were without equal rights, and that's the same in Europe today. It's not that irregular migrants in, in law and international law have zero rights. It's that they don't have equal rights and without equality, then you're vulnerable to abuse and exploitation. Yeah. <clears throat> Julia, you, you referred to unions uh, in, in the early 20th century uh, that made the real difference and brought worker rights also for free workers and, uh, and everything, which is an interesting point to make because uh, when you talk about the anxieties uh, in European countries today in relation with, uh, with migration and especially irregular migration, unions are still a bit wavering very often. Uh, they're, they're not sure whether they can fully take up the issue of irregular migration because they see it as threatening the, the rights that they've been able to secure for regular workers in their own country. So how do you see, how, how do you think we can transcend that seemingly or obvious contradiction in worker movements and union uh, mobilization? Um, well, I suppose, I mean, unions have not always been progressive forces, have they? I mean, if you think about the, the history of their relation to, to questions of gender equality or, or race and racism, uh, unions, just because they're fighting for workers' rights doesn't mean to say that they're fighting for all workers' rights. Uh, so that's been a matter of contestation amongst within the labour movement, and I suppose that that's what um, we have to continue to to try to discuss and and educate and to press for for a vision that's more inclusive and to press for for people to see solidarity and and to see that actually acting in solidarity um, is not going to undermine. The, the rights, you know, the threat to the rights that have were secured through the labour movement are not coming from migrants. You know, it's far more neoliberal economic policies and austerity and and all of these things that have uh, undermined the the way that the banking crisis was dealt with, etc. Those are the things that compromise um, and are leading to a kind of clawing back of, of gains that w had been secured for working ordinary working people not migration that that is not what's threatening it so i suppose it's about trying to to make those arguments and trying to encourage greater solidarity and, and commitment to genuinely universal protections for everybody um who's on a territory and and every worker Julia, if you allow me, I would, I would like to briefly return to the whole image of, uh, of 
slave trade and, and or uh, more specifically this uh, fugitive uh, slaves. And you say in the lecture, and I found that interesting, that almost all of the instruments and the strategies that European countries or, or government states are employing today to stop immigration, to to deny the right to movement to people, especially coming from uh, the Global South, uh, were pretty much there already in 19th century uh, United States, where the northern states employed them or the southern states. So I would like to, to ask you, can you give us a few specific examples of those? When you talk about passports and visa, for instance, I thought, I don't imagine that slaves could go to an embassy and get a passport or a visa to go to New York or to Chicago. So I don't know what you're exactly referring to. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, um, I mean, I suppose it's that when in Europe, when we taught the history of Atlantic world slavery, the focus is, is often on moments when enslaved people were treated as commodities or things so, you know, images of people shackled on ships or in chains being taken to auction. Uh, and obviously uh, those moments uh, existed and that those moments enslaved people, um, there was little they could do to, to resist or escape. But um, once an enslaved person had been taken to a plantation or a farm uh, or a city, um, slave owners had to allow a certain amount of freedom of movement because a, a slave who was kept permanently chained up in a dungeon would not be a productive asset and slaveholders needed their human property to run errands, to uh, travel with them when they went to visit people in other states. Uh, they needed, sometimes they, they wanted their enslaved people to, to hunt for their own um, subsistence or to grow produce, they wanted them to take produce to market, etc. So it was in slaveholders' interest for enslaved people to be able to move around a bit, but not too much. And obviously all of those possibilities, you know, if you sent your slave to sell some goods at a market, that meant what if they ran? And that's where slaveholders were dependent on the state to enforce their control and power by restricting people's mobility and that's where all of these um, mechanisms were devised so passes for instance if you that that were um you know early passports that you you had to get a pass if, if you were sending your slave to go and take some produce to to market you wrote a pass that uh said you and you authorized their movement and the patrollers would when they stopped the person say show me your papers and you had to show the paper from the master authorizing your movement um you know i mean the all of these the um the carrier sanctions for instance were because um when people managed to escape to a city and then a port city where they could get on a ship that might take them north um they they were worried that there were ship captains who maybe would take a bribe or who didn't really care or might even be abolitionist in, in leanings. And so laws were introduced to, to make it that, that the, any ship captain who a fugitive was found aboard would be subject to heavy penalties, sometimes even have the boat or the ship confiscated and so on. And so it's those kinds of... Um, measure but that's where the similarities lie yeah. if you, yeah. that makes and, sense. and that that refers directly back to what what you also mentioned in the lecture the uh, the, the the rescue ships on on the mediterranean <coughs> Taking the image a little bit further, when when you talk about fugitive slaves in the 19th century, we know that there was uh, what what is now called or what was called the Underground Railway. Uh, people helping escaping slaves to go up north and to get to relative security or safety. Um, you mentioned that there is an increasing criminalization of humanitarian action, but would you argue that in Europe today, we need a kind of underground railway to support people 
in their mobility, in their drive to get to greater freedom and better rights, uh, and, and try to keep them under the radar of this controlling and to a large extent repressive state machinery? Um, I, I don't know. I, I mean, about if you were saying about NGOs, I mean, I don't know that the Underground Railroad um, was uh, equivalent to an NGO. Um, in fact, lots of historians now say, well, it wasn't really a particularly well-organized or a single entity. It was more like a series of loose networks. Um, and uh, I think it's interesting that today, as in the past, um, people who want to move but who face these very heavy restrictions on mobility do develop their own networks to try to circumvent mobility controls. And, and often they do that in very ingenious and creative um, ways. But it's very rarely how it's portrayed in media and political hype about trafficking and smuggling. Uh, you know, it's not these huge sinister mafias. It's more a question of a cousin who puts you in touch with a friend of a friend who happens to know somebody who, et cetera, can help you. And I think that the Underground Railroad, what's called the Underground Railroad in, in America uh, in the 19th century was sort of more similar to that, like this not really a thing as mm -hmm. such, but a, a loose network of, of people who would help other people. Um, but I think actually the, it got its reputation as being a sort of well-oiled machine uh, run by a very clever group of um, well-organized uh, abolitionists. That, that was more the pro-slavery thinkers' fantasy about what the Underground Railroad was um, than perhaps the reality, which again is a bit of a parallel with the way that um, today trafficking is, is imagined and smuggling. Um, I, d I don't feel, I mean, I hugely admire the NGOs that are doing the humanitarian uh, rescue work um, and giving assistance to people who are uh, at risk from the, the violence of border controls. And I find it really shocking, obviously, the, the criminalization of humanitarian assistance. But it's important to know that, that organizations like Sea Watch are, are not running the equivalent of an underground railroad. They're not actually arranging for people mm -hmm. to move. They're just trying to assist and prevent, you know, save lives of those who do make that choice. And I feel like it's, I, I would be reluctant to say, oh, NGOs should take that on, not only because it would be criminalized as. Uh, illegal facilitation of migration, but also because I think we we have to change the law, um, yeah. you know, really to to yeah. achieve something that's yeah. not just putting more people at risk. But if if just a little question uh, there, because the way you describe the networks um, is, I, as far as I know, pretty clearly how it works. But not just that, there is a well-oiled machinery of people making big money out of the, the, the mobility of people that are denied their mobility by the European state law. So the, it's not just a kind of a, a family network uh, or a, a, the village people that meet each other in Athens and then help each other onwards. Uh, there, there is big money involved in, in this mobility because, as you described in the lecture, people cannot just take a plane, a, a cheap flight into Europe, so they're forced not just to make perilous uh, voyages, but also very expensive voyages in which they pay people that make big money on that trip, right? Mm. Well, I, I think it's debatable how much uh, big money is involved and, and the level of organization. And I think it probably varies according to which routes and, and who we're talking about. But I suppose, again, to me, the, the people who are making the most money out of this sort of immobilizing of other people are actually probably EU states because the 
if you look at how much the UK charges people to make visa applications, which they make so difficult to, to pass their tests, so you think this is huge amounts of money that are being taken by um, governments like my own in order to then just reject people's um, applications for visas. So I, I, I worry, but I, I think, you know, if we're thinking about who profits, it's not only the illegal or criminal underworld. And I, I mean, huge industry as well in terms of, you know, the, the legally um, sanctioned agencies that, that offer to process visas and do that and take you, which is one of the reasons why so many migrants are migrant workers who move through legal channels are so heavily indebted that they actually also face um, very, uh, you know, uh, are open to abuse and exploitation when they arrive at the the mm. point of destination. So, which which refers yeah. back to what what you said. A lot of these people were not born vulnerable vulnerable in a sense. They were made vulnerable by explicit policies. Uh, from the European states. And that goes beyond the immobilization. That goes right into their former lives. Uh, and, and you refer to agri agrarian policies from the EU or from Europe, uh, but also in, in, in a big way, armed trade, uh, which destabilizes countries for the profit of very few people in, in Europe, in the global north. So. <clears throat> Basically, your point is we are responsible, or at least European states are responsible for a lot of the destitution and the vulnerability that they claim they want to solve by making or calling an end to this so-called slave trade today. Yes, I, exactly, exactly so, but I think we are or our governments are, are heavily implicated in, in lots of ways. And of course, you know, historically we're implicated, you know, so it's the, the, the classic saying about we are here because you were there. And, and that, that's very, very relevant to a lot of the um, forms of migration that we see today in a lot of the conflict or think about the British role in creating the instability that continues in Sudan or, you know, I mean, there's many ways that you think that Europe is implicated. And I suppose that that's one of the reasons why, although, uh, you know, people can think about what's the role of, of governments. And obviously you look at many um, states that people are fleeing from. And these, are, it's, it's not that I'm trying to absolve dictatorships or you know the Eritrean regime or North Korea or something and say oh they're just uh, irrelevant but but I mean the the, the trouble is that um, governments of the global south on the don't have the political power on the, the global stage to to shape global policies on issues like migration nor nor issues like climate change and so you know, again, that seems to me where our responsibility is uh, is so much greater because actually we've uh, got far more power on this more global stage to 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 change things. Yeah. <clears throat> Talking about global policies, uh, in 2018, 2019, uh, there was a lot of debate on, on the global compact on migration, or I should say the global compact on safe, orderly and regular migration. And in Belgium, uh, actually, the government... Uh, fell over that global compact, even though it's, it's not very impactful and, and uh, it's, it's not a coercive compact, but still it was deemed by the main Flemish parties as too intrusive, too much uh, a problem for our national sovereignty. But for many people, the global compact was a kind of step forward to come to a global policy about migration that would help 
take the illegality out of it and, and make it more safe for people that wanted to migrate to be able to do that when countries would come together and, and try to arrange it. Now, my question in the first place is, we we're almost two years after the signing of that uh, global compact. Did it make any impact at all? in the lives especially of people migrating or is there been any development towards a safe and orderly migration? Uh, well, yeah, I don't know. The, um, the compact was, yeah, as you say, it was welcomed by some NGOs who thought it was going to afford some greater protection to currently vulnerable migrants. And of course, it was that idea um, that made so many far-right nationalist and anti-immigration politicians in, in a number of EU countries, not just Belgium, uh, get so upset about it. But actually other migrants' rights groups and scholars are quite critical of, of the, um, the compact because, you know, just saying it, it wouldn't, it doesn't go anywhere near far enough. Um, and I suppose, you know, I, I think I'd go along with the, the statement of the um, of FMAS, the Forum des Alternatives Maroc, uh, which says that the, the compact is inspired by and reflects the interests of um, Europe and America. And it doesn't actually guarantee rights or protections it, it, because it, it fails absolutely to challenge the repressive immigration policies that are leading to the um, multiple and grave violations of, of migrants' human rights. So it, it doesn't insist on the inalienable right to freedom of movement. And, and so it, it, there's not, and as you say, it's, it's not, it didn't, um, compel anybody to do anything. It, it put no actual restraints on power. Um, so, and I think we can see from what's been going on over the last uh, couple of years that, and certainly if you look at what's happening in the UK at the moment uh, with in response to people who who actually have rights in international law to, to be in Britain um, and are trying to cross the channel you can see that it hasn't achieved the safe, orderly um, migration that it, it promised. So <clears throat> to, to look a little bit further, when, when migrants are um, looked upon as not us, uh, it's one of the points that you make in, uh, in your lecture, that we actually take recourse to the imagery of slave trade and slavery, uh, basically because it reflects us as different from them when, when these uh, restrictions would be put on Europeans, white Europeans, we would call them a crime or we would take recourse to rights. Now we say it's a, an equivalent of a 19th century slave trade. Does that also mean that in terms of of how we treat migrants, does it make a difference whether they are black or Asian or from Eastern Europe? There has been a lot of racism against white migrants also, as far as I know, in UK and, and in the rest of Europe. So um, I don't know if that distinction, us and them, can, can be a distinction between white and black in a sense. Mm. I mean, obviously, it's complicated because, uh, you know, racialization or who is seen as being a racialized other um, shifts and changes and, uh, yeah, and, and xenophobia um, is a, a, a real thing. And yes, in, in Britain, of course, you know, somebody who's white, but even speaking with a a non-British accent can be at risk from these sort of ethno-nationalist um, thinking. I mean, I think that uh, that in terms of how it's racialized and where it's it's racist is 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 if you look at things like um, uh, passports, the the strength of passports from different 
regions of the world and uh, you know from most um, African countries uh, there the passport will uh, allow you visa free access into a, just a tiny number of places in the world uh, as compared to passports from the EU or um, elsewhere where the, it's, it's thought of as a majority white population. So I think that there are ways that you can see that uh, parts of the global south and again through that kind of historical legacies that that it is still um, sort of racist in its in the way that it uh, plays out in terms of freedom of mobility yeah. because you know whilst it's true that Polish people in Britain can experience and do experience xenophobic uh, anti-migrant hate and uh, discrimination um they they're not as restricted in terms of their global mobility as somebody from Nigeria for instance so yeah I'm I don't know if that answers yeah. the question quite, no, it's, but it's, it does <clears throat> I would like to to come to a closing question uh, and I kept the difficult question for the for the end of, of our conversation but one of the things that you refer to in the lecture is, and, and you com or you compare the the current anxieties about migration in Europe with the anxieties of uh, of white privileged uh, free people in the United States or or in other European colonies in the 19th century or before, when faced with the prospect of equal rights for non-white people, um, <clears throat> and in the, the the examples that you gave are quite clearly, I would say, not just anxieties, it's, it's prejudice uh, and it's toxic. Now, my question is, can we, is it sufficient, in a sense, to talk about the, the anxieties in European countries by making only those toxic examples? Aren't there real and genuine anxieties of, of uh, changing societies, of uh, especially people with very low skills or, or low education skills that they might face uh, extra competition. I don't know. There, there might be, uh, that's my question, are there possible anxieties in Europe vis-a-vis -vis migration and migrants that could be beyond the fear of an elite to lose its privilege? Um, I don't know, it's complicated, isn't it? Because lots of things get mixed up under the same heading there. So I think that we've already spoken about the issue with regard to when we were talking about the labour movement, mm -hmm. uh, about anxieties about undermining low-wage work and competition and those things. So I'm going to leave that to one side. Um, but I mean, in terms of this that people talk about, and I hear it a lot of people saying, oh, well, you know, there might be legitimate concerns about our European way of life and so on being under threat. Um, and I suppose that's where I, I see the, the, the parallel. And I, I find it, yes, troubling when, because what exactly do people mean by that? Um, and can, can there be legitimate concerns about that. I, I, I mean, if we think about how should we be working with and listening to, you, you could ask the same question about, well, should we be working with and listening to the anxieties of, of people um, who are currently supporting moves in Poland to withdraw rights from LGBTQ people? Or, you know, should we be working with um, the anxieties of men who believe that women have got too many rights and freedoms under EU law. I, I, I think every movement to extend rights to groups that were formerly uh, excluded meets with a certain amount of resistance from those people who already enjoy the rights and privileges. And not all want to cling on to them to the exclusion of others, but there's there often seems like there are people who, who feel that this idea of equality is, is a threat to them. Um, 
And I, I think that there is a tension then about whether we can be committed to universal human rights and equality, but also accommodate arguments to the effect that, you know, certain groups are, should not be treated as equal as others. Um, so that that seems to me problematic that that even in fact that that politicians have allowed that to to develop as a a discourse. But I, having said that, I, I do think that there's there's a lot more that needs to be done in terms of dispelling myths about um, migration and showing how it's been politicized and used to deflect attention from policies that actually threaten. Um, ordinary working class Europeans' well-being, like austerity politics and so on. Um, and also a lot of work to be done to try and, you know, show people uh, or to deconstruct this idea that human mobility is a problem rather than something that's just integral to being human. We all want to move. We all need to move. It's part of what being a human being is, and it's a, a positive benefit. So, uh, I mean, I suppose that rather than than trying to just, um, you know, reject, well, I, I do reject the idea that that there is a threat from this that needs to, but but it, I guess that I, I accept that you need to, to get people to see more clearly the, the positive benefits mm -hmm. of everybody being mobile and being equal yeah. which brings us back to the end the conclusion of your lecture uh, where you say that it is probably hard for us to imagine uh, a world without borders a world where everybody has the same rights uh, once they're in the same territory but we should remember that the abolition of slavery once was considered too radical an idea to contemplate too and that today we we are so far f removed from that situation that we think that using the slavery image is a way to protect people and your point has <laughs> been we don't need that slavery image we need the idea of equal rights for every human being and that's the challenge that, uh, that I think that Julia O'Connell put forward in this lecture. And so thank you very much, Julia, for being with us today and for giving us that very challenging insight uh, as a frame to work with for the rest of what we're doing in Brussels, in the UK, in the rest of Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you.